written this down because this is actually something that I talked about at a fame forum in 2013 in York. Um, and rather than having to go through all the process of rethinking all these ideas, I managed to find the old paper that I had before and just slightly updated it with changes of things like English heritage to historic England. So it won't be novel to some of you, but hopefully it will be worth hearing again for those who might have been there in York and can remember the talk. So, although this subject is a challenging area to discuss at this conference session uh, for commercial archaeologists, it is essential to address these issues. Much of what I'm going to say will be familiar to you, uh, but my intention is to try to engender a wider understanding throughout different, perhaps opposing, sub-disciplines of the profession as to how we should try to develop a more cohesive relationship between development, planning process and archaeology. And the slides that I'm going to show are, I'm not going to point out anything on them, they're just complementary to what I'm talking about. So you can either concentrate on them or you can concentrate on what I'm saying. Uh, the fundamentally flawed introduction of price competitive tendering suggests it will incentivize the lowest possible, possible quality of service. Now, this quote is one which many archaeologists could, could relate to uh, and believe has led to a structural failure of the profession. This quote was not about archaeology, however, but instead it was released in June 2013 by the Bar Council in response to the government's proposals for legal aim, aid or reform. It voices concern that the plans to agree contracts on price rather than quality could increase the likelihood of incompetent or inadequate representation and lead to, to delay. Contrary to these quotes by the legal profession, and despite the fears about how competitive tendering would affect the quality of archaeological work and the, and the profession's tectonic fracture into a contractor-curator division, over the past 23 years we have learned to operate within this brave new business-centric world. So first, some achievements. The successful development of commercial archaeology over the past 25 years has generated opportunities for graduate careers, it has produced a massive output of archaeological data, and it's led to increased professionalism. Prior to 1990, rescue archaeology was very largely dependent on state funding through direct grants or employment stimulus packages, with an infrastructure of archaeological units based on historic research committees and a patchwork of local authorities. The introduction of PPG-16 enabled greatly increased levels of funding from diverse sources to be invested in the profession. Out of the opportunity provided by planning need for developers to pay for archaeology, an explosion of small to medium-sized businesses has occurred all over the country. A range of different types of organisations have evolved, such as the trading arms of educational charities, local authority business units, non-for-profit organisations, university units, sole traders and private companies which employ thousands of archaeological graduates and have allowed greater opportunities for career development than existed previously. So this is a success story. But on the other hand, commercial archaeology is driven by developer funding and the downside of this success story has been the operational difficulties caused by price competition within a largely unregulated marketplace. Tender competition in the marketplace all too often has led to lowest cost being the dominant factor in developers deciding which archaeologists to appoint. This leads to a downward spiral, with accusations of cowboy operators, one-man bands, and larger companies buying projects at unrealistic prices, which in turn holds down pay levels for archaeologists and fails to deliver the quality of archaeological outcome that as a profession we would aspire to. If this scenario is true, and it probably is for many cases, why and how have we as a profession allowed this to happen? Is it a failure of regulation? And how do we now begin to change the landscape so that we operate within the marketplace in a manner similar to other professionals? The marketplace is determined by supply and demand. And on a very simple level, prices rise and fall based on either the scarcity of or over-provision of suppliers, dependent on the amount of need from clients. The level of demand 
is provided through effective implementation of the planning process or via other mechanisms where heritage input is required, such as HLF projects. According to the state of the market uh, in commercial archaeology survey, the economic downturn led to a 20% reduction in employed archaeologists. In reality, this did not equate to a 20% reduction in the number of archaeologists, but rather a reconfiguration of the existing landscape through fragmentation and expansion of the supplier base. Many new small businesses have developed, whilst larger and well-established units have been closed down by their host organisation, e.g. universities or local government. So we have a marketplace with oversupply. But the marketplace isn't that simple. Different clients have different needs, different procurement processes, and different priorities. And there are various thresholds that, are, that archaeological suppliers would need to cross in order to become eligible for larger and more complicated clients or projects. The cutthroat end of the market is often smaller scale construction jobs where archaeology has been left until very late in the process before commissioning and procurement is often delegated by developers to agents and junior staff to project manage whose main priority is shaving costs off third parties. That places us at the end of the feeding chain providing estimated costs for a client who doesn't understand the structure of those costs and who believes any risk can be absorbed by the lowest cost archaeological operator that they can find. This type of marketplace will lead to market failure, a cycle of low level, uh, sorry, low value, high risk jobs in which commercial success is dependent on not finding archaeological remains because sufficient resources to investigate and record them may have been squeezed out by the competitive bid and the repetitive need for suppliers to win at lowest cost in order to have a field job for their team to move on to. We're now moving into a marketplace with increasing demand from HS2 and other infrastructure projects. And as a response to this type of situation, FAME has drafted procurement guidance to improve client understanding of what to consider when choosing an archaeological business. The concept of this documentation is that we need a market with a well-informed, intelligent client base. A client who will understand that commercial archaeological practice forms part of the knowledge-based professions and is not just a subsector of the construction industry, which employs temporary manual workers as site staff. It outlines the difficulties in quantifying the scope of archaeological work, why contingencies will be needed, and how there is no standard method of measurement used by quantity surveyors for estimating additional costs. It also states that lowest cost alone is not a reliable method for choosing an archaeologist, as it will not help to ensure quality, cost effectiveness or minimize risk and is not consistent with how other professions are appointed. The main thrust of the guidance is in promoting risk awareness amongst prospective clients through their consideration of the financial liability, the size and competency and ability to keep the program of the archaeological organizations they invite to tender. It draws on best practice in public sector procurement to accurately scope the works, identify client priorities, analyze risk management, and to think through how best to manage the procurement and implementation process. Finally, the guidance includes a checklist of criteria that could be applied to help with selection of the most appropriate archaeological business for the scope and scale of complexity that the client needs. Public sector procurement has had to adapt to EU regulations and operates under three main ethical points. Uh, transparency, fairness, and equal treatment. Although lowest price tendering is still allowed for the provision of simple services, generally the meat approach is used, most economically adv advantageous tender, which should provide a balance between quality and cost and is assessed by set and pre-disclosed criteria employing a reasonably transparent scoring system. For HS2, this will supposedly be achieved through scoring based on 80% quality and 20% price. It is this kind of balanced and informed selection process that professional archaeology would benefit from, so that aspects such as competency, capability, technical merit, standards and quality assurance, skills level of the workforce, ability to deliver on time, financial stability of the organisation and related attributes can be balanced against the price offered for the job. 
For those working at the coalface and trying to compete within the construction industry, this may seem wishful thinking, but it is in fact in tune with other initiatives. In May 2011, the government published its construction strategy, which aims for a profound change in the construction sector so that the country benefits. It wants the public sector to become a more informed client and to replace adversarial cultures with collaborative ones by establishing value for money through benchmarking and cost targets rather than through lump sum tenders based on inadequate documentation. In addition, it promotes an approach that sees design and innovation as key contributors to creating value and that suppliers should be engaged on a sufficient scale and duration to incentivize research and innovation. A key element of this new approach will be via adoption of information-rich business information modeling, BIM, technologies, process and collaborative behaviors that will unlock new, more efficient ways of working at all stages of the project lifecycle. BIM compliance is to be int introduced for all public procurement by 2016, and it is in inevitable that there will be a trickle-down effect from big contractors to SMEs within the private sector as a result of this government initiative. So archaeologists will also need to gear up to become BIM compliant. Professional bodies such as RICS and REBA have already developed systems to facilitate this change in approach to collective working. Our industry-wide standards will provide clients with greater certainty and consistency in the construction process, reduce risk and provide a benchmark for performance is on the RICS uh, website. <coughs> and to manage the process effectively, to deliver the project objectives and create value for the client is on the REBA website. Key wording, which has equal application for archaeologists as for surveyors or architects. Perhaps CIFA should be urged to produce a similar system of wording. <coughs> These are all steps in the right direction, but there are plenty of other ways in which we need to improve our own professional value to clients. For example, the REBA approach has adopted an eight-stage process, which could act as an established model for archaeologists to adopt. We already have our own staged approach to pro projects, but if we can link to a framework and terminology already known throughout industry, then client understanding is greatly enhanced. This can be clearly paralleled by ecology, where a phase one habitat survey is instantly recognized by developers and their agents and how the priority timing for these surveys are essential if deadlines for planning applications are to be achieved. Similar to this is the need for land quality and geotechnical site investigation to be conducted, for which the programming, access and utilities information is timetabled into a developer's plan at an early stage, an obvious overlap with archaeological evaluation. Lesson number one is that we should always understand more about the total project from a developer's viewpoint rather than just be restricted by or responsive from an archaeologist's blinkered vision of the world. We need to use terminology that other professions and developers use and understand. Validation, determination and the consent process, baseline survey rather than DBA, site investigation rather than archaeological evaluation, REBA stage 4 technical design will be RWSI, and the eventual outcome a client needs is discharge of their conditions, for which our staged approach and report and our report outputs are steps along the way. This adds value to our input as it demonstrates our awareness of how archaeology fits into the total life of the project and gives confidence to the client that we are professional and business friendly rather than working for clients as a sideline with a perceived specialist indifference to the rest of the scheme. This approach is also consistent with, with uh, PRINCE2 project management principles, which stresses the need to focus on outcome rather than process, to manage by stages, to maintain fingertip control of time and budget, and to predict the, and control risks and opportunities. Commercial archaeology is all too often process-driven, with aims, objectives and products often at variance with the actual needs of business, often undertaken because that's the way it has always been done, in the past 25 years, and performed by rote, rather than applying key planning policy measures such as heritage significance and proportionality. This is a problem profession-wide, from those advisors who respond to applications and set briefs, 
to national agency responses for development that may have an impact on the settings of heritage assets, to undertaking yet another 2% of trial trenching uh, exercise on a mineral site, or 25% excavation of all linear features. Lesson number two is that as a profession, both suppliers and regulators, we must be seen to be innovative, innovative, to be prepared to prioritize, to address the key issues of heritage significance and robustly justify why we are undertaking a particular scope of work. We need to be seen to be able to reduce cost and increase efficiency as appropriate to target resources and to maximize value in terms of the acquisition of new knowledge. This requires us all as professionals to respect each other's knowledge and experience, whether commercial archaeologist, planning authority or advisor, or national agency, and to work together for the best outcome, rather than continue with the more adversarial arena which dominated the period of PPG 16. Mineral operators, for example, compete with one another, but they also have trade associations and a powerful political lobby group where they work together for the benefit of their industry. Even though technical expertise can be appreciated by fellow archaeologists, the value to the client of paying more for one archaeologist rather than another due to their level of knowledge and skill is not easily apparent. We need to communicate this to clients by both the regulator and the supplier explaining the threshold standards required and the benefits of technical expertise and experience. The added value for the client is in reducing risk and for archaeology, it is likely to result in the delivery of a better product. But in addition to our technical expertise, the value of a, of a professional is their knowledge and experience of related fields in which they operate, such as an understanding of planning law and process, of what documentation is needed to support planning applications, the roles and responsibilities of different parties, health and safety, which other disciplines are relevant for a particular development, how they operate, for instance, how remediation for contaminated land or ecological constraints need to be integrated with and will reduce the scope of a program of archaeological investigation. In addition, essential business planning and project management skills and some knowledge of basic e economics must form part of a professional's commercial skills repertoire, adding value to their ability to contribute beyond that of a specialist niche discipline. So lesson number three is that we should develop within the profession education pathways and CPT to broaden our knowledge base. And it is up to CIFA and FAME to lead on this, as no one else will provide the necessary training opportunities. In landscape architecture, chartership candidates have modules that include ethics and values, professional duties and liabilities including contracts, negligence, professional indemnity insurance, health and safety regulations, understanding the legal system relating to EU regs, uh, as well as the UK, and devolved governments, professional relationships, and different types of contractual arrangements, including the role of other professionals, a detailed <coughs> module on professional appointment, including change of co change to contracts, copyright issues, innovation, fees and charges, tendering, briefs, methods of calculations and charging, payment and recovery of fees, work schedule, dispute, dispute re resolution, etc. They learn about practice management, the planning system, environmental and heritage policy, and many other subjects. That is why architects often write heritage statements, or are the preferred suppliers for conservation management plans and conservation area appraisals. Basically, architects are trained to do more than their own discipline, and can charge more for their services because of their wide knowledge and versatility. And if individual chartership is introduced for archaeologists, then surely this would be a good model for us to adopt. As archaeologists, we have had to develop knowledge and skills of these areas as part of the job. And this lack of a didactic and standardised professional approach is a contributory factor to the low fee culture that archaeologists promote. I doubt whether many emerging commercial archaeologists, one-man bands, sole traders, small and medium-sized businesses, actually produce proper financial plans and include a full understanding of costs when they calculate their tenders. If this was more universally applied, then, then, basic, uh, then basic business planning would be reflected more accurately in the fees being charged, 
and lead to more realistic cost competition. Such financial planning needs to include salary levels and employers on costs. National insurance, pension contributions, eight days public and 20 days uh, <coughs> holiday, downtime for admin, tendering, lack of work, training and sickness, so that an actual chargeable day rate should be based on between 180 and 220 days a year. In addition, support staff and management time, bad debt allowance, office costs, insurance, equipment wear and tear, upgrade, as well as a sensible profit margin of, between, of, of around 6%. Profit is essential to invest in skills and technology to develop efficiency and reward staff. And yet the state of the archaeological market survey records very few commercial practices which have operating profit. Those that did were just 2%. This is a fundamental weakness for future stability, let alone development of best practice within the sector, and the profession must redress, must redress this flaw. By contrast, the Canadian Statistics Office has examined heritage institutions in Canada in 2005, 2006 and 2011 and identified in the for-profit organisations that operate there, that's F-O-R, for-profit, uh, a rise in profit margins of 8% to 12.4% over that period. Very different from our situation. Profit is a, um, sorry, in addition, the importance of cash flow cannot be overstated and the general model adopted by archaeologists of staged payments based on completion of site works and completion of reports, which could take months or even years duration, is commercially bad practice. An example that could pose a great risk to commercial archaeologists is a recent court case, which found in favour of a developer who sued an architect for late delivery of houseboating designs. Because by the time these were received, three months late, the recession had hit and the proposed development was no longer financially viable. Hence, the architectural practice had to pay the developer compensation for losses. The incentive for clients to pay promptly is reduced once they have completed their main objective. And some clients can be joint ventures or single project companies which are folded up on completion, with no redress for late invoices to be paid. Although legal mechanisms for interest on delayed payments of more than 30 days exist, it is far more sensible to ensure that contractual terms include methods and time periods for invoicing and payment for, to reduce financial risk to commercial archaeologists. <coughs> and model contracts NEC, NEC3 for professional services and short duration work exist which can be easily adapted for our purposes. We should therefore develop strategies for teaching these related skills at undergraduate and CPD levels and impose barriers to entry for commercial practices that cannot demonstrate adequate understanding and provision for their place within a knowledge-based profession. This would go some way towards managing risk and together with clearer identification of what are fixed and variable costs would allow greater understanding by both clients and suppliers of what risks are involved so that an equitable apportionment of risk can be agreed between us. There is a need for the profession to develop some means for a standard method of measurement or new rules of measurement to help with improving transparency and competitive tendering, to help with budget setting and to help with increasing the likelihood of receiving payment for the variable and unquantifiable elements of archaeological investigation. Lesson number four is therefore that as a profession we need to sell ourselves more effectively to clients through the value we bring in helping them manage risk. This can be achieved throughout the project life cycle at due diligence and options appraisal stage, at planning application validation and determination, at mitigation and condition discharge, and even during operational and decommissioning stages as appropriate, e.g. if design included preservation in situ and monitoring of archaeological remains. The engineering profession is valued by clients because inaccurate design or calculations would result in costly and potentially disastrous consequences. Perhaps it is difficult to appreciate any similarity between structural engineers and archaeologists, and thus the value we could provide to a client appears less. Land quality engineering, however, provides a closer parallel to archaeology. Developers and regulators Need to, feel, need to fully understand the potential liabilities from ground con contaminants and what options for remedial measures exist. Although we would not see archaeological remains as contaminants, for business there is a need for similar risk management to both archaeology and contaminated land. <coughs> Unfortunately, developers may not be as responsive to this argument as they should be. 
because they may calculate that the risk is low and it's worth skimping site investigation to reduce costs overall and to avoid finding something that will require further costs during construction. Equally, their internal divisions between procurement, planning process and project management might mean that it is in the interest of a particular employee to reduce margins on costs in early stages because the budget for later stages will pass on to another team within the company. As a profession, therefore, it is essential that regulators are robust and objective in enforcing appropriate archaeological input at all stages in the whole life cycle of a project. Unfortunately, examples of undermining archaeology as a profession are evident from the actions of archaeological regulators, development control advisors, whose understanding of roles and responsibilities are poor. For instance, regulators who respond to an EIA scoping <coughs> request with a demand for a DBA. This conflates one product with another, as an EIA is a much more substantial piece of work than a desk-based assessment, more akin to a landscape and visual impact assessment, and this conflation leads to a lessening in the market value to produce uh, an ES chapter and the scope of work necessary to achieve that. I've even known one development control archaeologist who believed that he had a direct contract with archaeological suppliers rather than understanding the legally correct devolved relationship via the planning case officer and the client. Other regulators tell developers to send them several WSIs, several written schemes of investigation, so that they can select which contractor should do the work. Apart from the inappropriateness of this approach, it also implies that design of an archaeological scheme of work should be free something easy to produce. In reality, design is exactly what clients recognize as of value to them and worthy of professional fee. And it is quite unacceptable to devalue us as a profession by this misguided approach. As a profession, we must let design be innovative, not merely relegate it to an exercise of broadly generic briefs or specifications. Good design should address questions over what products will be delivered, by what means, by when, what risks exist to thwart successful completion of that program of work, and what actions can be taken to reduce risk or compensate for it, rather than banal statements over what percentage of a linear feature will be excavated. Consultants also undermine the profession. Not me, of course. <laughs> <laughs> when they don't fully advise their clients on the options and risks that they face, but rather take a superficial approach which gives a veneer of doing their job by merely ensuring that they find the lowest cost supplier for their client. They should engage with all parties to ensure there is a proper understanding of the client's priorities, their aims and objectives, the criteria necessary for appointing the right organisation to fulfil those objectives, and that the design of the works is appropriate for the heritage significance and type of development proposed. Archaeological consultants should also have thresholds to cross before practising as they need to be well grounded in their subject, experienced and senior professionals with proven track records in order to provide valuable advice to clients. Consultant engineers, for example, have an essential role in ensuring quality and accuracy on the part of the engineer who has been contracted to design and undertake a project. This relates not only to the design, but also throughout the construction and post-construction process, including constructive critical feedback to the contractor and ensuring timetables are maintained or variations agreed as necessary. The parallel with archaeological consultants taking responsibility for ensuring and helping contractors to complete field work and post field work assessment, analysis and reporting to schedule and justifying to the client any variation or contingency that may be reasonable is self-evident. I would like to suggest uh, that we introduce some financial linkage between consultancy and contracting archaeologists which would lead to an improvement in the quality advice to clients as the risk would be shared more equitably and there would be greater incentive for a consultant to ensure that the best organisation is chosen for a contract rather than the cheapest. This could also be applied to methods of accreditation by CIFA. Sorry, I've got my glasses, I can't read that. <laughs> um, this, should, this could also be applied to methods of accreditation by CIFA or national agencies. What incentives are there for commercial archaeologists to become recognised for best practice when this usually involves cost to the organisation whilst giving it no competitive advantage within a system that has no barriers for cheaper and less quality-driven operators? 
Historic England, for example, restricts work on historic buildings to conservation architects and engineers who have been accredited for their knowledge and experience in working with historic materials. There is no similar restriction, however, on which archaeologists uh, can work on historic environment, uh, historic England advised or commissioned projects. And if we are to enhance the quality and value of our profession, then such measures should be introduced. The RO scheme, for example, might then form an accreditation that would be acceptable for more sensitive and complex projects and a quality threshold that new entrants to the marketplace would aspire to cross. Almost finished. In contrast to those developers who do not regard paying for archaeology as a necessary and valuable use of their budgets, there is a growing group of companies that now operate through framework agreements, through approved supplier lists and partnership arrangements in which risk and profit are shared and linked with ensuring that partnering organisations have similar approaches to quality and to professionalism. Pre-qualification questionnaires and subsequent invitation to tender documentation helps to ensure that would-be suppliers have sufficient resources, an appropriate level of standard and quality assurance measures to work as effective partners in achieving the goals of the ultimate client. This model of best practice encapsulates much of what I've been discussing as it requires quality thresholds to be crossed before a supplier can become eligible to, work, to bid for work and therefore the minimum cost tender process is replaced by a balanced set of criteria for deciding which supplier to appoint. Oh, you've got to sink there. Finished. That's, that's missing. I don't know what's happened. It's disappeared. So in conclusion, this is supposed to be a whole series of points that fame has, 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 has thought up, but it's all missing. This is, this is serious. Um, in conclusion, there are directions in which we need to move if we are to raise our standing as a profession, and we need all parts of the profession to con contribute to this improvement. Fame has set out an ambitious and aspirational set of goals, which you can see here, <laughs> uh, for forthcoming years, which could include informed procurement, greater barriers to entry, partnership working, greater innovation, and grasping the opportunities of government and industry-led modernisation programmes. To improve best practice, we need to raise our profile so that clients understand and value us as a knowledge-based profession, which in turn will help them in effectively managing the risks of development. Implementation of all these measures would show how we have learned from our mistakes as a profession over the past 25 years and would let us remodel the market so that applied archaeological practice and professionalism, oh look, here we go, uh, <laughs> enjoys a sustainable future. Now, I never put this, this um, what do they call it? Um, no, no, no. Animation, or whatever it is, in. So how it's managed to do it. That's, 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 that's good. Okay, thank you.